Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Word of Grace. Uh, just in case there's any first-time visitors out there, if you're listening online for the first time, we welcome you, and we just hope that the Holy Spirit just really touches your heart and gives you uh, a word of promise for the rest of the week. And uh, for all the rest of you, family and friends, just it's great to see everybody. I feel like I haven't been here forever. Um, typically, I share on like the second Sunday of the month. I do like little intros and stuff. You guys all know. But we were on a family vacation, and so I knew that I would be speaking the next week coming back, which was Father's Day. So I had like, you know, I was gearing it towards Father's Day and everything. And then I got stung by a, a wasp or a hornet last week. And so I was all doped up on, uh, what's a Benadryl? So I, I roll up in the parking lot and I get here, you know, big, I try to hide everything, a big smile on my face. I'm talking to Greg and then, you know, everything looks great. And then I get in the back room, I'm getting like hot flashes and I can't even get my thoughts together. All the Benadryl was kicking in at once. And I'm like, holy smokes, Pastor Steve. I was like, I don't I can't even think right now. So, so here I am today and, you know, it's three weeks worth of like intro that God's just been pouring in. So I have like this like six hour message that I like want to do. That's how much like information I have. So I'm actually going to save it for next month. So in a couple weeks from now on the second Sunday, I'm going to ask Pastor Chet if I can speak a little bit longer and while do like a really good message because I think it's so important, not only just for fathers, but, but mothers and just Christians in general of being that that figure in the household for your children, for your spouse, for, you know, your coworkers, your friends at school and stuff. So plus I'll dismiss Sunday school before I speak because it'll be a little bit longer uh, and it'll be geared more towards the parents. So this morning, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be speaking because it's not my turn, but uh, Pastor Ryan asked, and I just love getting up and just sharing what God's been putting on my heart with you guys. And so I was just excited because God gave me like a portion this morning as I was jogging. So let's just uh, open up in a word of prayer and we'll dive right in. It's only going to be, it's going to be short, just a quick five minute thing. But Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for this church, Lord, we don't ever want to take it for granted that we still live in a free country, Lord. We live in a, a country where we can come to church. We're not persecuted of our faith. Yeah, we may get teased at work or school or, you know, little different things like that. Maybe we got a little conflict at the dinner table when, uh, you know, holidays and stuff with the family. But who cares? Lord, there's saints all around the world right now that are literally dying for you and sticking up for you because they love you because you love them. So right now, as we sit here and we're having fun and we're worshiping you, Lord, just really shine your presence to those around the world that are in prison or, or are being shunned by their family for real. The Middle East, where they can be killed because of their faith and brothers are turning in brothers, parents are turning in children and children are turning in parents. Lord, be with them, build them up, let them know that you'll never leave them nor forsake them and build them up this morning as they're going through a tough time. But Lord, right now we're free. We're free indeed in you and we're free indeed in this country. So let us have a great time this morning. Let us celebrate. Not just, this isn't just a church service, but it's a celebration because we're together dwelling in your midst, Lord, together. So just build us up. Let us have a great time and carry it on throughout the day in your name. And we glorify you. We thank you for everything that your son Jesus did on the cross for our salvation. Amen. All right. So I was jogging this morning and, it, and just all my thoughts were coming together because even outside of the church, I know Pastor Chet's been going through revelations for like the last six months. I've been loving that. You know, we're getting closer to the end. And that's what I like because I like seeing where we're going to be and the victories that we have. But I've been doing my own studies, too. You know, and I've been going through Genesis through Joseph. You know, we got Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And then we got Joseph and Joseph is the one that was sold into slavery by his brothers. And then after that, he ends up in the house of Potiphar, you know, and he's, and he's just going through this whole ordeal, you know? And so I, you know, I still got the father's day theme in here a little bit, you know, in all parents, what are like two major things that we got to have as parents for our children and our spouses to see? And not only that, but just as Christians that our coworkers can see. People all around the world, what they can see. And I would say that is integrity and character. It's so important in our lives. 
And I remember when I first got my electrical license and I, I, one of my first jobs as a licensed guy was doing the little St. Thomas Catholic school over in West Springfield. And I remember walking through the hallway and this was, I've only been saved for maybe a, a few years, you know, cause I got saved like right around 18 or 19 or something like that. So I've only been saved for maybe like five years. I'm walking through the hallways and I see this, this picture and it says character, you know, and then underneath in the smaller print it says what you do when you think no one's looking. You know, and I was thinking, I've been reading all about Joseph and, 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 and you know, here he is, you know, what, what his brothers and what the enemy meant for evil, God is using for good and he's going to restore him in the end and use him for a greater purpose. But in the midst of all of Joseph's life, he's got these two things. He's got like character and, and integrity. That he's clinging on to a hope with God that there's got to be something in the, in the future. Some type of either rescue or, or even if it's not, he's just hoping for it. And it's pushing him along and it's keeping him going. But he gets into this one part and I love it because when I was jogging today, I was just thinking about it. And then Isaac kind of confirmed that. I picked Isaac up from uh, Christian camp yesterday and he was telling me that he learned all about Joseph. You know, and he's telling me about it. I'm like, I bet you that's what I'm going to speak on today if I have to speak. And I'm just going to open up in uh, Genesis chapter 39. I'm not going to read the whole portion, but basically Joseph is in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar is the ruler at this, at this stage of the game, not Pharaoh, but he's the ruler of this section. And he, and he says, and you know, God's promise was he was letting everything Joseph do to succeed. And he's rising Joseph up. And Potiphar gives him control of everything. Everything in the whole entire house except his wife. And right, and so Joseph is just succeeding into everything. You know, it's funny too, because there's even a verse in here that says he's a little handsome. And then all of a sudden we read, and I'm gonna pick it up from there in verse seven, and it says, And it came to pass after these things that his masters, speaking of Potiphar, his master's wife starts casting longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Basically, like, hey, let's go, let's go in the other room and have sex. Right? And it says, but he refused and said to his master's wife, and this is crazy. I mean, before we were all saved, that's like every guy's dream. You're, you're like trying to like, you know, have girls long after you. He's not even trying. And the, guy, and the most important guy's wife is longing after him. That's like every unsaved guy's dream. But here he is, and he refuses it. Because he's got integrity and character. And we're going to go into that. But he says this. He says in verse 8. But he refused and said to his master's wife. Look. My master does not know what is with me in this house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. Verse 9. And this is key because Pastor Chet taught me this when I was a young, kid, uh, young man. And it's, it's, it goes into everything. Discipleship. Marriage. Father everything. You're Christian, your whole discipleship. And it's the B part of this verse. It says, there is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me, but you speaking of the wife, because you are his wife and ready for this. This is, this is what pastor Chet taught me. And, and it goes in everything, a part of my life. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against who? Sin against, right, sin against Potiphar's wife? No. Sin against Potiphar? No. Sin against the people of Egypt? No. Sin against God. It doesn't matter who all these other people are, what they think, if he could have got away with it. He does not want to sin against God. He has that integrity and that character in him where even if he could have got away with it, he knew he couldn't get away with it with God. And he did not want to upset his God. He loved God so much that even when he was sold into slavery, even when he got put into Potiphar's house, and he's just like, oh my God, what is going on, God? I thought when I was a, a younger kid and you gave me all these promises for the future for my life, I thought that was going to be real. He clinged to those. 
And he had that godly character, right character. Who are you when nobody's looking? Do we have that godly character, knowing that when nobody's looking, God is still looking? Don't we want to love God up and just build him up and just let him know, like, hey, listen, I love you so much. I'm not going to let you down. Even if I can get away with this, I don't want to because I don't want to upset you, God. I love you, right? So for fathers out there, for mothers, for Christian role models, let's strive. It ain't easy. Believe me, it is not easy. Everything in this world is going to try to cause you to stumble. It is not easy. I'm not saying it is. Matter of fact, the whole, everybody thinks once you get saved and you become a Christian, it's easy. Well, on the opposite, it's actually harder. Because at once, even though we have sickness, all these other things, stresses of life, all this other stuff, at least you're flowing with the traffic of the world. When you get saved and you become a Christian, now you're going the opposite direction and life is even harder to a degree because we have the Holy Spirit, which makes it easy. He helps us swim up the river the opposite way. So this morning, I just want to encourage us, though, because we know the ending. We know because he, he agreed with God and he stuck to that accountability or that uh, integrity and that character with God. The outcome was great. The outcome was him fulfilling what God wanted him to do, the purpose and the work that he wanted him to do. And because of that, this is what happens. I wrote down just like two seconds ago. So important to have integrity because not only will it save you, but it could save your family and those around you, right? Because of, jo because of his, his uh, character and uh, integrity, not only did it save him, but it saved his family, his brothers, and then all of Egypt and everybody in the long run, you know? So with this, I'm just going to end with this to lighten up the mood and everything. You know, we think like, God, like, what would I have done in that situation? You know, a lot of times I think like I watch Braveheart or Gladiator and like all these other movies. And I'm thinking, man, like, how would I be in that situation? Would I be that firefighter running into the burning house? Would I be that police officer that, you know, runs into, you know, something, this chaotic thing and saves somebody? Could I do that? Could I be that martyr, that Christian that stands up for my faith? What would I do in that situation? Well, I'm, I, like I said, I was jogging this morning. I'm running. You know, I, I did like a six and a half mile loop and I'm running back. I'm dying of heat. I got my shirt off and everything. I'm running, covered in sweat. And I, I'm running past this old timer's house and he's out there hedge trimming, right? He's cutting up the bushes and he's got his wife with him. They're, they're an older couple. And, I, and, he, and he's just standing. He's got the six foot ladder and he's just standing there looking at the bush like, man, this is crazy. And I yell out. Hey, I go, that looks pretty tough. I, I go, that looks hard to manage. You want help? So he said, like, oh, yeah, come on over. So I'm coming through the yard, hot body. It's all covered in sweat. Sun's glistening off me. And, it, and the, the old lady, the old lady's looking at me like in the verse, casting those longing eyes. You know, she's trying to flirt with me, right? And I come over, and the poor old guy's looking all depressed, like I can't change my wrinkles. And I'm like, geez, I was just thinking about Joseph. Like, what would I do in this situation? Where's my integrity? Where's my character? So I grab that hedge tremor and I give him a little wink. I'm like, ah, man, this, this does look tough. I don't even know where to start. And I held him up to the, the wife's mustache. <laughs> I show you, you old goat, you old Jezebel, trying to flirt in front of your husband. Do we have that? That really didn't happen. I made that whole thing up. I just wanted you guys to laugh before Pastor Chet gets up here. I did do the jog, and when I saw the old couple, that whole scenario like happened in my mind. I could write comedy shows and stuff. So I just wanted to make you guys laugh. But do we have that in us? What would we do if we were put in a situation? Would we stand for God? Right? So from here on out, let's strive to know God's word. And the reason why we want to know God's word is so we know what to do. We know what pleases God. And then we can have that integrity and character. Amen? All right, amen. I'll see you guys in two weeks for another intro. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for today. And uh, we just ask that you would seal this message to our heart as Pastor Chet gets up here and the Holy Spirit speaks through him to us. Lord, same thing. Open up the ears of our soul, the eyes of our heart, and let us 
chow down on this message that's about to come and let it just really build up our souls and strengthen us for the weeks and months to come. We love you, we thank you, and we thank you for what your son did on the cross where he died as a ransom. And he paid for all of our sins so that we could taste salvation through faith in his grace. We love you and we thank you so much for that. Amen. I had the same experience this morning. I was running with no shirt off, <laughs> glistening in the sun. The outcome was different. The police showed up. There you go. Well, anyway, I used to do that. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 18. Freddie, that wasn't that long. That was good. I was trying to think of a sub-message for the little time. It sounded like I had left, but we have plenty of time. This is a great chapter. Most people read this chapter and talk about something else. We're going to talk about the chapter. Uh, it is an amazing chapter uh, to set you free. Dennis, you know that song you sang on the chains, Broken? That needs to be like a song for the addiction ministry. That's a great song, wasn't it? He sets me free. The real prison is sin. Isaac was telling me today about going up to Hume Lake, and he was talking about a guy who got up, and he was telling all the bad stuff he did. He was in prison, and he met Jesus. And I looked at him and said, I've been in prison all my life till Jesus set me free. There is prisons. Reminded of John Bunyan again, was he in prison when he was in prison, or was he free? Was Paul in prison when he was in prison? Or did he say, I may be bound, but the word of God is not bound. I am the Lord's free man. So there is a freedom beyond walls that God wants us to live in. And the scriptures, one of my favorite verses, you know, I say it over and over again, is John uh, chapter 11, uh, where he talks about the idea of the son has set you free. You're free indeed. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray a lot, but we really need you because nothing is communicated without the Holy Spirit, which you sent for us. We pray, Lord, we would jump out of the pot like the frog as it's heating up, which the world wants to heat up. We're here a few hours. We live in the world daily, yet we're not of the world. Yet, Lord, we get dirty from the world. So I taste, pray right now you would cleanse our hearts and our minds and our spirits, our wills to be disciplined to hear that we may profit from today and we might have meat and we might find more meat in time of need. So just bless these scriptures and prepare our hearts, Lord. Help us to put away the cares of today. And after church, Lord, help us to focus Without ears to hear, we learn nothing and waste all the time. We are here in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Be praying for people. We had a few operations this week. Doris was operated on. She's healing up. Fred Hermison was operated on. He's healing up. Be praying for them. Be praying for the addicted ministry we're going to start. I'm actually more believing that God stopped it, that I might go the right way. And uh, we might start our own ministry, something different. Why do the same thing everybody else does? Right? If we have the ability to take something and make it better, why not make it better? True? Right? I'm an old car fixer upper. You know, if I could soup up an old car and make it better than it ever was, then that was a great thing. Uh, we have the ability through the Holy Spirit to be creative if we touch God and make it better. I don't want a, a ministry that just gets people off an addiction. I want to get them on an addiction to Christ and good works, which they're created to, which gives them meaning, purpose, and life in their life because they're able to what? None of these things, even the integrity part, you can do without the Holy Spirit. You can do without touching God because you don't have any integrity, by the way. <laughs> it's not in you. You aren't a good person, by the way. Right? I know that might hurt your feelings, but I say it to myself, too. I know a long way ago that I'm not a good person. I, I like Luther's Mighty Fortress uh, song. He wrote, he had a songbook in one hand and a Bible in the other. 
Both were important. But his words have scripture. Verse 1, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing, our helper in amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe, the seek to work us woe. His craft and his power are great, and he's armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing. Does ask who this may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath is his name. From age to age the same. And he must win the battle. Amen. You can read those verses on. They're always good. It's like reading scripture retranslated. But we are in Revelation chapter 18. We just talked about the spiritual demise of the Babylonian kingdom. In chapter 17, we're in 18. And now we're going to talk about the Babylonian power system of what? Government. The two go hand in hand. I mean, we are all about the two things that we don't want to talk about, just be stupid about, is what? Religion and politics. Do you know the Babylonian system is both? It is both. It is in the way of God, taking your mind off God, who made the heavens and earth. It is the world system, and there's a God of this world, and his name is what? Satan. He's the God of this world. He's the one who we've said before, in Matthew 4, Luke 4, he's the one who offers all the kingdoms and power of the world to Jesus if he would what? Worship him. He hates God, we're supposed to love God, and he hates men, and we're supposed to love men. He may seem that he loves you, he may seem that he likes you. He may offer everything your heart desires. His ways are humanism. His ways are materialism. His ways are the lust of the s, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I mean, you almost feel like you're God today, in a sense. I mean, Amazon has made it so easy. I mean, I always got to, well, I don't have to watch too much because it's all small purchases, but isn't it amazing how you could just like, I want that. Dink, dink, I got it. It'll be in the mail tomorrow. I feel like God. I was just ordered something. I go, I feel almost like God. I could instantaneously, instantaneously gratify my materialism by getting what I want or need. Sometimes it's a need. Sometimes, most of the time, it's a what? Want. Do you know, no, God never promised to give you your wants. He did promise to give you your what? Your needs. And so we have to do a little sociology of history and where we are today. I mean, we are in perilous times today because we have moved like the speed of light to where we are today in the past 150 years ago. Do you realize 150 years ago, 90% of this country were farmers? You know, farmers are good people. Now, well, no one's good, but there are people that usually have God in their life in one way, shape, or form. Why? Because they have a real need for God. They have to, you know, get out. And I, and again, I have that picture in my house, you know, where I have the two people praying over the crop, like we said last week. And they need God because they have no power for that crop to what? Harvest. That's why Israel had days of like harvest, because they knew that they needed to thank God and ask God and thank him when they got the answer to what? To be able to survive or they would starve. They needed water. They needed it to rain. The ancient gods always had those things too. The pagan gods always had those things because man's always needed those things. But the only one who's ever brought the increase of those things on the earth in that system is what? God, because the earth is his and the fullness thereof. And he made it what? Very good until the fall. And then this Satan took control with what a lie 
I mean, I love John 10, 10 because it describes him like in John uh, 10, 9, 10. It talks about God comes to give life more abundantly. But what's the devil come to do? He comes to kill and destroy. He's a liar from the beginning. He lures you in with things you don't need and then destroys you in the system that he's made because he what? He hates you. When you look at all real world religions, it's it's interesting to look at world religions and see, you know, the basis in one word what describes them. And again, we've talked of this in times past, but the idea is that, you know what, the satanic humanistic religion today is based on hate. Christianity is based on what? Love. God so loved the world. Love your brother. The Jewish system was based on oneness. Confucius is based on what? Very socialistic system based on human wisdom. Human wisdom. Wisdom from below. That works. Proverbs without God. Probabilities. <sighs> what did I miss? The Hindu system is based on suffering. That's a great one, right? Maybe you'll come back better. And then the Buddhist system is based on nothing. <laughs> great goal in life. Do you know why Satan thinks you're nothing? All these are satanic systems besides Christianity. And Judaism was ordained of God, but progresses into Christianity because he's not just the savior of the Gentiles, he's the savior of the Jews and all mankind, isn't he? And that they are systems that have come to play, and right now it's come to play where the Antichrist is building his system, and it's based on humanism. There is no God. An evolution. Isn't it great to see the rhetoric in, in our government? I was watching something about, uh, you know, I, well, sometimes I hit the radio and I listen to a talk radio show, and the, the, the new world today is I'm evolving. Okay? I lied yesterday. Hey, you lied. No, no, I didn't really lie. I, that was back then. It sounded like it was, a, it was a lie, but I didn't know enough, and I've evolved now <laughs> in the last six months to another better position. But back then, in my evolution process, that decision was totally okay. But I'm evolving. It really does away with repentance, right? I don't need to repent because I was devolved back then. <laughs> and now I'm evolving. Hey, that was me back then. I was a monkey. And now I'm a chimpanzee. It's a system that destroys all kinds of rules, regulations, and laws and makes them up as it goes to benefit the person who's making them. It's perfect for the Antichrist. Perfect perfection. The opposite of all morals. A whole different system. This is the end of that system. Remember, God has a system to take care of you. Every God has to have a system. What, what, which God is going to give me the best, right? Choose a God in the ancient world. Which God do you want? Choose a God when you go to India in Hinduism. Get a good one. Well, our God promises this and that. And they have three million, hundred million demon gods in India on the last count. I mean, you've got to generalize when you have that many. But all demons are a place for demons to play with people as they starve to death. Satan hates men. He hates you. You're nothing to him. You're only a tool to be used and abused to hurt God and then destroy you. Are you getting that? He's created a world system, both religious, with all these religions in it, and many more sub-religions, and also what? Political. Power, the branch of what? Government that does what? Provides and protects for you, because that's what, one of the things you look for God to do is what? Provide. Make the field grow, Lord. I know what I should do. I watered, I, I planted, I watered and all that. But you've got to make it grow. Hey, Lord, keep me safe. 
Keep me family self. Ultimately, you're looking for someone higher than you, no matter how strong you may be. You learn real quick that there's always a bigger bully on the playground, don't you? He may be two years older in school, but he's bigger and badder. There's always somebody stronger that can do you what? Harm. And so there's the longing and looking for God in the sense of what? Provision and protection in my life. And so I look to him. I look at the best gods. I look at the, the real God that would he really stand up like the old, the old talk show when we were kids or the game show, you know. Uh, what was that, truth or consequences? Or was that the real? Remember the guy who used to be, well, the real person, real stand up, you know. Get all the gods on stage. We're describing their attributes. And will the real God please stand up? Well, Jesus stood up. In fact, he was lifted up. Above standing on a cross for me and you. True? The real God was lifted up. And if he's lifted up, he draws men to himself. Because there's no greater story, no greater truth. And you can meet him. As you receive him and you believe in him, he makes yourself known. He makes himself known to you. And he does that through many different ways of miracles and fate and different things he works through in his miracles. He makes himself known to the sons of men. And then that becomes real. We need a real God with substance, don't we? This is the end of the false gods. Isn't that good? This is the end in chapter 18 of the government. Don't you hate governments? The more they try to perfect them, the more they mess them up. True. I thought the beginning government this country had was the greatest government in the world. They messed it up. Right? Now when we say in God we trust, the question is what God? You know, you can change words. We change words all the time. Uh, we don't really mean Jesus. We mean the God of this world. The God of humanism. That's where our country is today, isn't it? I mean, it's crazy. I was listening to a thing of Joe Biden, and whether you like Joe or not, Joe, but it was about the Catholic Church was talking about a idea of uh, giving him communion. And of course, if you believe in abortion as a Catholic, those that came out of the Catholic Church know the Catholic Church, still in the Catholic Church, wherever you are, consider yourself a Catholic. Um, if you believe in abortion, you shouldn't be able to be allowed to take communion. That's a Catholic canon. I was listening to a bishop talk about Joe and, and say, basically, he cannot. That's our doctrine. But there's a big but. 60% of all Catholics believe in abortion. That's not the real question. The question is, does God believe in abortion? Right? Is it his will? If it is his will, then hallelujah. But if it's not his will, then guess what? I don't believe what God doesn't believe. But there's that whole thing of giving loopholes. You like loopholes? We like loopholes. I can do something I shouldn't do because there's a loophole. That's called judging yourself. That's where conviction comes in. Convicted of something with principles. You have, you have integrity. You have principles, don't you? You have a conviction of principles. If I do something, then you know what? And it's not the will of God, then negative consequences are going to happen directly from God or indirectly by reaping and sowing. If I do something that is right, then positive things are going to happen either now or they will happen sooner or later. I have a conviction that there's a penalty or a reward for what? Doing the right thing. That's why I want integrity. I don't have it. But I know the one who does. I know the one who's put together and I know he works and I know everybody else without him is what? Crazy. Confused. Right? Because if you're in the world system, you are in the system of confusion. Cities begin the whole process here. If we talk about Babylon, we talk about cities. The first city, I'm not going to turn there for time, but the first city was built by who? 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 No, before even Nimrod, in the very beginning. Cain. Cain, remember Cain? Sin crouches at the door. He, he brought a sacrifice. God didn't accept it. He goes, what's wrong with you? Just bring a good sacrifice. Bring the one that I want, like your brother. 
I don't like that. I like the work of my hands. I like giving what I want to give. I like doing what I want to do. And the self of human from the fall, because he was in the fall right after Adam, the first son, came in. And you know what? He went in the field. He talked to his brother. And he did what? He killed him. And God marked Cain. There was no capital punishment then, but he marked him. And Cain went out and he built a what? A city. He says he went out from the presence of God. In other words, he went out. I don't want anything to do with God. I'm going to go do things my way. He built a city and he named it after his firstborn, his prodigy in his image. And there's the beginning of cities without God. Cities have always been that. Cities have always been seats of wickedness. If you find the highest crime rates, they're where? In cities. Cities, it's easy to get caught up in the things you make. Man-made wealth. It's easy to think you're a god. It's easier to build wealth. It's easy to have places in cities usually becomes the place of what? Man-made government, man-made government does something you'll love about the fall of Babylon. It's no more taxes when it falls, right? How many hate taxes? Come on. Hate taxes. It's always the two things that are sure, death and taxes. Well, both will be washed away by God when he comes for us, right? Isn't that good? It's a system from the fall. But when Jesus rises to his kingship, that will be over. So you know what? Yeah, they do what? They extort because they become a power base and they get men and they extort from people uh, in other areas and they what? They tax them whether they like or not. And then they take their money and either keep it or spend it on things that they don't want. We're in those systems now, aren't we? I don't mind taxes. I hate what the government does with my taxes. I have no say in that. You know, I could yell with Danny and stuff, but usually it ends on death airs and they do what they want anyway, true? Doesn't mean you don't keep yelling. It just means you realize that, you know what, the ultimate payment of those things is Babylon is falling. It's falling. We talked about Babylon as the system with Nimrod and all that, and he becomes the hunter of men, and that system does what? It disperses in the Babylonian system, which goes all through. Do you remember the idea of the idea of kingdoms that rule that are, are filtrated from Babel when Babylon is built? If you remember in Daniel, we see the statue that was built for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was like none other. I mean, it was a wonder of the world. They even had air conditioning in Babylon. The walls of, of, of Babylon, which were a wonder of the world had waterfalls in the walls. And what happened with those waterfalls, somehow they were able to miss them. Like you see those misters in nice restaurants outside. They had misters of water that would what? Air condition the air as it blew through. And so the palace in Babylon in the middle of the hot sun was what? Air conditioned, cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah, the system wasn't too cool, but the advances were. And they were a wonder of the world. Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was God. Remember, you always think you're God when you're amazing. It's good to think you're not amazing. I like being a failure in the sense that that's who I am. But God can do great things in failures, right? True. I was born wrong. <laughs> if I'm right, hallelujah. It's got to be God. And God loves to use weak people to do great things, doesn't he? This is a system that the head was gold. That was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar thought he was God. Remember, he looked out in the balcony and he became, he went, this is what happens when you think you're so amazing in a system. Satan wants to eat you. You think you're doing your work, you're doing Satan's work, and you think you're amazing. He looked out the window and he saw all this advancement of this wonderful city, a wonder of the world. And he sat, what did he say? I have built all this. He never dropped a drop of sweat probably in his life. 
Look what I have built. Great Babylon is done by me, the glory of all the world. And God heard it, and God said, today you're going to be a beast. And you're going to eat grass, and your fingernails are going to grow for seven years. There's a great story. There's a Joseph, and there's a what? A Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to be a stinking animal. Do you realize drug addictions will you become an animal? Do you realize that? I did it my way. Burr. Fingernails grow, hair grows. Homeless, eat some grass on the side of the bank. <laughs> Satan lures people into death and escapism. He makes them look, think they're amazing, and then when they find out they're not, they fall and they go into all kinds of addictions. They don't want to go God's way, so they go their own way. They don't want to give God their sins, so they keep their sins, and their sins do what? Satan ends up doing what? Trapping them, binding them in prison, and then slowly kills them. I'll say it again and again. This is all the thing of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. This is the thing of the system, materialism. Do you realize say, Babylon was like materialism? Cities became materialism. Do you remember Lot? Let's go to the story of Lot. Lot was doing pretty good with Abraham. He was following him everywhere. Good, good uh, nephew. He was like a son to Abraham because his father died. So he was like a new son. He, Abraham didn't have a son, but he had what? He had Lot. And so they went everywhere. They traveled. They worked. They built a great, great herd. And they had 300, maybe 600 people following them. 300 men. So there had to be women, right? Can't keep men without women. So we had all that, kids, this whole caravan, like moving, meat market, moving through the desert. And then, they, you know, there was a drought, and Abraham didn't consult God. And where'd he go? A city, Egypt, right? And, you know, he lied, he did things he wasn't very, he had very much integrity, giving up his wife. And what happened to him? His Pharaoh caught him and knew he was with his wife and said, you know what? They got tumors and all kinds of diseases. And they realized it was because of this woman that came into Pharaoh's house that was Abraham's wife. And so he gives him back. Couldn't kill him because, you know, the God of God of Abraham was great. And he says, get out of here. Well, Lot went with him. But guess what happened with Lot? Lot left Egypt, but Egypt didn't leave Lot. It's the old song. How you gonna keep them down on the farm after they sing Purry? It's an old First World War song, right? All the farmers go to the big city and say, you know what? This has got something for me here. They ain't got this out in the country. It's like the prodigal son. They ain't got this stuff out here. I kind of like the city. Oh, yeah. Grass in my mouth. Yeah. I like the city. Yeah, a lot like the city. A lot like the materialism. And so where did Lot choose to go? The place he shouldn't go. He went and pitched his tent near Sodom in the plain. He chose when they had a fight with Abraham and the herdsmen. I want to go down there and be with those people. What did Abraham say about Sodom? When he rescued Sodom. I don't want anything from you. Hey, take anything you want. You just saved our life. When the armies, when he delivered Lot later on from the five armies, take anything you want. It's all yours. You say, we'll take our people. Abraham says, nope, I don't want one thing from you. Lest you say, do you say this to the world? Lest you say, the world has made you great. Unless you say that we made Abraham great. You're not making me great. God's making me great. Because greater who is in me than he that is in who? The world, right? Greater who is he who is in me. I'm not losing my integrity that I got from God. I'm not losing that voice in me of conviction where the Holy Spirit says, this is the way, walk ye in it. I'm not losing my direction or I'm lost. I'm not losing my provision. I'm not losing my protection. Therefore, I don't walk in what the world always trying to do. What Satan's always trying to make people afraid, isn't he? I'm not losing my peace. 
The world offers peace, but the Bible says peace, peace, and there'll be what? No peace. False peace. Pseudo peace. Temporary peace. But God has peace that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and mind in him. I'm not losing that for this world system. I need to be under God's control. I need to see what the, what the plan is. And the Bible says that we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. I think it's 2 Corinthians 2.11. I'm not ignorant of his ways. I know what's in cities. I've been in cities. Many of them. And you know what? There's nothing good there. Maybe a few evangelists and people trying to pull people out of the fire. But I ain't living there. Babylon is spread through all the earth. Remember, the nations were spread languages. They all knew from Babel, so it spread through all the earth in different ways and different religions in the world. But there's only one true religion, and that's God's. And there's many, many others, and that's Satan's. They're doctrines of demons. I don't care how nice they are. I know humanists that are wicked nice. I can, I can be nice to anybody. Eddie Haskell was nice. <laughs> it's very easy to master con nice, niceness, right? I want you to see me as a good person. No, you can see me as a bad, bad, redeemed person. How's that sound? And if I don't follow God, I lose redemption as far as experience. And then God has to take me home or, or knock me out one or the other. So here we are with Babylon destroyed. This is the system that comes out of the spiritual. Remember, this has gone in all churches. Do you see how this, listen, churches take on governments, don't they? Why do you think you have so many humanistic churches today? Because we don't have the Anglican church as far as the state power. We did it one time. That's why the pilgrims came here and the Puritans to escape it because they were being killed by it. We don't have the Roman Catholic Church as a government, but we did one time. And they killed 50 to 100 million people. They didn't do that with a church service, a revival service. They did that with armies. True? And that's why when they came over, they had separation of church and state, because we will not have a state church. Well, we have a state church today. It's called humanism. And we have a doctrine of demons, which is called political correctness, which is all about humanism. And we're no longer created by God, but we're all evolving. And we don't have to put a name on it. It just is. Do you understand that Satan is the best deceiver? Right? I was watching a, a thing last, uh, last night, like real late, and this person was very, very deceptive ultimately. And I looked at my wife and I said, do you know Satan makes this woman look like a child? Yeah. How deceived are you? I would say in one way or shape or form, you are deceived. And so am I. No one knows who the Antichrist is. No one has eyes to see. But we should know the systems. And Babylon is in the whole world, even in Washington, D.C. By the way, Washington has seven hills. I've said it before. New York City has seven hills. Did you know that? There's your commerce age. Maybe we are the home of the Antichrist. <gasps> Not America. The home of the cowards who hide in basements. Maybe we're the home of the Antichrist. I never thought I'd see America be what it is today. But your forefathers will roll over in their graves. The, whole, the home of who knows what. You fill in the blank to whatever you want to. Perfect place for the Antichrist to rule, right? Do you know the Vatican is a city by itself? It has our uh, uh, American ambassador. Do you know Washington, D.C. is separate from the United States? Do you know Jerusalem is separate from Israel in many ways? Israel has seven hills too. Rome has seven hills. Washington has seven hills. New York has seven hills. Yeah. Babylon has gone through all the world and is a system. I don't believe just a city. It may be. It may be revived, but God also said it would never be revived once it was destroyed. 
And it still isn't, even though Saddam Hussein tried to res it up, now it's still a home of jackals in the desert where no one lives. God said it wouldn't be revived. So you have a idea of the metaphors here to say the system is scattered and it's now not just a city. Guess what it is? It's the whole world. It's the whole world. <sighs> Chapter 18. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having real authority on the earth, was illuminated with his glory. Even angels can be mightier than Satan when God gives them that power. He cried with a mighty voice, with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen and become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk the wine, all the nations have drunk the wine of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. That means these people aren't the people of God. They don't know God. The people of God commit what? Adultery with this. So when we bind into the system, we bind into what? Adultery. The world unsaved binds in the fornication because they're not married to God. The merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxuries. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. Don't you love this? God's always calling you out. You know, God calls you out today for materialism, all these things. Lest you share with her sins unless you receive of her plagues. Because if you don't come out from her, this is what you get. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which the Lord has mixed, mixed double for her. See, here we are in a tribulation. There's still grace, but logistical grace has been ended. This is the age of vengeance of our God. Didn't we talk about this? The vengeance of our God. God has to give vengeance. He tells me not. I'm his kid. He goes, wait, I will pay. This is a double cup. This is the lex. I can't remember the last word on top of my head. But this is in Latin. This is double. This is eye for eye, tooth for tooth of the Old Testament. Don't just knock out one tooth. Take two. This is God in his wrath. This is God putting a final end to the system. In the measure that she glorified herself, in other words, she became like God. She lived luxuriously in the same measure. Give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I will sit as queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Do you know we have the District of Columbia? It's interesting to know that a, a woman stands on the top of the Capitol building. We go back to the great whore. Isn't that interesting? Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord who judges her. This deals with two parts. Babylon is destroyed. The three, the three parts, really. The earth mourns Babylon's destruction. They mourn this. They don't mourn, basically. I'm, I'm going to metaphor this or just talk about this a little bit. They don't mourn for the people who died there. They mourn because of their lack of materialism. Their wealth. This is where they got everything out of the system. And there's four things that David Jeremiah talks about here that really, really bring out the idea of her mourning and her like wickedness that she has on the earth. Four things. Number one is the sin of depravity. Remember, every foul spirit is there. That every mind's mind is depraved. The depravity goes so far that remember in the end times, Kids will even give up their parents. Households will be divided, right? There'll be no loyalties. We have that now when we don't have the nuclear family anymore. But we have, just like in the Soviet Union or with Adolf Hitler, with the Hitler Youth, the indoctrination of your kids. Do you know we all taught something? You programmed something? 
I had to learn. I always go back to the basics, eat, drink, all those things. You're indoctrinated in what you believe. Why do you think it's important to have sound doctrine from God? Truth. Because it's easy to believe a lie, especially if they offer luxury with it, right? This is depravity. This is the ancient world. They thought evil all the day long. God could even break through. They just thought evil all the day long. In their minds, they were foul, and they were in doctrines of what? If you don't want doctrines of God, guess what? You could have doctrines of demons. One binds and kills you. One looses you and sets you free. The birds, all the foul birds were in this place at destruction. And this is their influence. It really talks about the idea if you go to the parable of the mustard seed when the great tree happens. Mustard trees can't make great trees. So most all scholars believe that when all the birds come and cluster in that tree, it's anti-false religion. It can even be Christianity. Christianity doesn't have Christ, but we're Christians. Christianity has social programs, but doesn't believe in God. Christianity that takes away from the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and puts other things into place. Religion. Just dead religion. Be good. I want you all to be good. Well, that's hard to work out for an addict to the world. Right? For bad habits that only God can break. That's why we need an addictive ministry. We can't take away the bad without giving something good. True? I need to give you something way more outrageous than what you're doing. I need to get you occupied in life, not occupied in death. You have a good, good run in occupied in death. All those around you. Yourself. How about let's be occupied daily with life. And life more abundantly. This is false influence. This is medium. This is the world we live in who takes over the internet, takes over the what? The TV. I mean, you have to work to be good. You have to do anything. If I want to be indoctrinated, I just turn the TV. If I want to watch something good, I got to find it. It isn't playing on the local channels, by the way. I got to dig it out. I got to go to Right Now Media, which you all have, by the way. I got to watch something good and profitable. That means I got to work. I can't just sit there and go. <laughs> I got to work at it. Because evil is everywhere. A medium is everywhere. Oh, yeah, there's some good people on it. I watched some good shows with my wife about horses and stuff this winter that, you know, when it's 5 o'clock dark. And I'm like, it's all good. Then when somebody dies, no one mentions God. I'm like, no one mentions God. Could they ever mention God? The guy's dead. Could somebody say something about God? Or why don't they say something about the worms and the canker, if that's what they believe in? Why are they saying nice words over a dead body? He was a really great guy. I'll pour beer on him. That's politically correct. Right? Don't laugh. You'd be a pastor. You know, funeral homes are inundated with people that die and they have no nobody to say anything over them. They look at each other and say, somebody should say something. Yeah, but we don't know anybody to say something. Yeah, but somebody should. You know, undertake like funeral homes are starting to talk about God, even the guys that run it. I know one that uh, did Oleg's son's funeral, and he, he gave a great thing at the end, and he's a Christian. He's a Catholic. He might come to this church one day because I led him to Christ years ago. And you know what? He might come. He goes, when my mother dies, I'll come because if I, if I go to your church, she'll die. Old Catholic lady goes to church every week. He takes her. If I went to your church, she would be dead. I go, all right. Well, you know what? But he was preaching at Oleg's funeral at the end. Why? Because there's no preachers anymore. How about that? How about like, okay, let's go to the Catholic church. Do you remember when the you had big families, your grandmothers and grandpa? You Catholic. Raise your hand, you old Catholics out there. Do you remember if you had a bunch of kids, the church would want one of them? You know, you need to give a girl to be uh, a nun. You know, one of your sons should be a priest. 
What if I said that to your kids? No, my kids are going to make money. Really? What about wanting one of your kids to go after God? I talk to my grandkids all the time. Maybe you'll be a preacher for after I'm gone. But Papa, I'm going to make money. The greatest thing in the world is to be a proclaimer of the, the, the Word of God. And you don't have to be a pastor to do it, by the way. I did it way before I was a pastor. You just have to love God and be obedient to God. That's all you have to be. If God makes you a pastor, great is that, and woe is you. There you go. It's a mixed bag. <laughs> the birds, the media, the influence. Number three is the infidelity. The infidelity. They had infidelity, and they were what? They were what? They were living in fornication. What did they do? This world system claims to be God. Do you remember Satan's lie to Adam? You will be like God. Right? What's the world want to make you? Strong. How about women today? I mean, so there's women that have been in this church, and they don't go to church anymore. My, my girls are strong. I go, wow, that's great. I, remind me to tell my grandsons never to date them. They're strong women. It's like, that's great. I kind of like, you know, <laughs> I don't mind them being strong in their own decisions, what they believe. But if it's aggressive and like I'll beat my your grandsons up, then you know what? I'm a little scared of that. If a girl beat you up on the playground, that was a bad day. You would never live that up. Yeah, it's just the world system is what? They're in idolatry. They're in infidelity. It's like, you know, our guys that think they're God. Let me tell you something. People aren't God. You will fall on your face. I've seen people with humanism. I've seen people with money. I've seen people with hundreds of millions of dollars be completely miserable. It will not meet your needs. And so these basically are people in this system that they find glory in themselves. They don't even know they're worshiping Satan, and Satan laughs as they separate themselves from God, and they, they relish and eat on his system. They don't even know they live with the dead, but they will find out. Number four is their inhumanity. They don't care. They care about luxury. They don't care about India. They don't care about people starving, really. They don't really care. I just care that I have luxury. I love luxury. I really do. I do, I do, I do. But you know what? It can't substitute for what? God and my responsibility to the world around me. I like to work hard. I like to have things that I work hard for. I like to enjoy them in some moderation. I like to build a barn, not three barns. I like to be able to provide for my own. That's my responsibility. If I don't do that, I'm worse than an infidel. I like to have an average lifestyle in this world that I could do what I want, that I'm not in debt, nor do I hoard money. I like that. And that's Ecclesiastes. God gives you the ability to do that if you want to work for it. But I have to work on my relationship with God is harder more. And humanism and luxury, they have all these luxuries and they have slaves and they have gold and silver and they're all mourning because they're losing these things. They're adornment, they're gold. Those that invest in gold, well, I'm really safe if I have gold. Really? Your gold in this day will be worth nothing. The system will be gone and not to be found again. It's the strongest Greek word uh, in, this, in this whole portion here is it's gone. It is gone, gone, and it's going, and it's completely gone, never to be found again. The system will not come back again. And they worship this. And they have love of what? Self and the God of this world and what he can give them and not a love for God. And this forms in all humanity. This is what Schaefer used to say on personal peace and affluence and why people rebel in America. Because America is completely into materialism. We all are completely into it even the russians are into it they drive nicer cars than we do it's a system that traps you and makes you work and give no time to god but everything to what pay your bills and get in debt and be enslaved it's a system and it's not what you need it's what you want 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall want everything. And they push it out and push it out. That's why I love the missionaries that said, I'm going on the mission field to Indonesia with nothing. Don't you love that? Where's that at? True? Materialism. Now, I'm not saying you can't have nothing. You would have to throw stones at me. I have to kill myself. But you know what? You better be in the system of God. You better be working for the things of God, not just becoming the church. That will not last. Because you sat in a pew will not be your... Well, Jesus, I was in a pew every week. Did I tell you to be in a pew every week? No, you did not. But that's what we did. We were in pews. And we sat... These are seats, really. But pews... I have to do what? I have to be a doer of the world and not a hero only. What's that begin with? Giving. You know how you break out of the system? Satan is a what? Taker. Nimrod took the souls of men. Did he not? Take, 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 take. And God is what? A giver. You have to give. You have to give. Youth, that's why we have a tithe. Tithe bucket in the back, guys. I'm not preaching offering in the sense. I'm preaching that you need to give. Because if you're not, materialism has you by the throat. And you'll make every excuse not to give. I need. Really? Who told you to get in that giant debt you have? I needed stuff. Really? You needed a car you couldn't afford. Really? Really? materialism and it slaves you it bonds you and it takes all your time and all your relationship and all your ability to do the work of god because you're consumed in what prospering in this world i like to prosper in this world but i give and i give and i work one of the main reasons i work number one is always want people ask why you work that i may give to those that have need i might take care of my own you should memorize that verse to the very core Ephesians 4.28, let him that stole. Do you realize if you don't give to God, what's due? Do you realize if you never get to give to God, you made yourself God? Do you realize the measure you give is a measure you make yourself God? God asked for 10%. That's, all, that's the minimum he asked for. But you say, no, I'm going to keep that. Then you're saying that God's just going to give to me. What's that? That means you made yourself God. God, give me. Give me, can I, can I have some? No, no, you don't need anything. I do. Give me, give me, give me. And you just made yourself God right into Satan's bind in materialism in the world system. And guess what? That's an abomination to God. That's called adultery, by the way. People have tremendous needs out there. I don't need your money. I haven't got a raise in 13 years. I don't plan to get a raise in 14. In fact, I told Vinny, what did I tell you, Vinny? I don't need one. I don't want one. You know why? I owe God too much already. I don't want to put up a debt list before God. I still have my business. I still work in the church. But I look at, you know what? I can take care of my family. I think pastors should get paid. And you know what? That's it. And I have plenty. And I need to give plenty because let he that steals stole no more. I don't want to steal from God what's his, but rather working with his hands. That's why I like blue collar. The thing that is good, that he might be able to take care of his own and give to those that have what need. As Dave Ramsey says, the good Samaritan would never be mentioned if he didn't have coin in his pocket. True. We need to work. We need to work. And we need to be doers of the word, not deceivers of our own self. And the system that we live in perpetrates that and kills you and kills the world around you. Because what could you be if you were free indeed to the world around you? Right? What could you be? Well, I'm only me. You and God is a mighty army. Right? Isn't it true? It's a Shulamite. What do you see in the Shulamite? I see a banner of two armies coming at me. God and her. Two armies. A man or a woman filled with God is like two armies coming at Solomon. 
Who can find a godly woman? Who can find a godly man? If they are godly, they're givers. And they break the materialistic bind. Because you look around you, all that I have, I look at it. I don't look at it and say, look all I created. You know what I say? Look at all that will burn here. Or somebody else I don't like will take it and use it. Because I'll be dead. I enjoy it while it's here, but I realize this ain't my home. I, I started in a tent, and I'm going to end in a tent somewhere. That's all Abraham had. Because I got a city that's built waiting for me. It wasn't made with anybody's hands except God Almighty. And he's the maker and builder of it. That's Christianity. And that challenges every one of us and should make us better than we are. Trust God. You know, God says if you give, this is again, this is only life. God will open the windows of heaven in your life. Not just your pocket, but your marriage. Who the heck wants to be married to a selfish person? Very uncomely, right? Father, we pray your word. Speak to us, Lord, when you destroy all these systems and you light up the world with your glory. And the lion lies down with the lamb and the joy of the Lord pervades every being. We love you, Lord, this morning. We pray that you send us out on a hot day. I pray, Lord, that we would pray about the things we need to pray about, the addiction ministry, our role with you, our learning with you, our growth with you, that you would make us more like you. Let not today be the only time we feed ourselves. Help us to feed ourselves, like Freddie talked about himself doing that we may be strong for you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You guys are dismissed. God bless you guys.